I chose to leave my homeland and emigrate to America. And what attracted me to this country was this pioneer spirit, the collective freedoms. I thought to myself back then, no other country in the world has this much of a focus on the future or on new technology. It was that feeling that I felt very strongly a couple of years ago during my citizenship ceremony. I felt it so strong it made me cry twice. And I feel like today sometimes when it comes to transportation, we've lost that pioneer spirit. We sometimes travel like we're in sardine cans. And we're so focused on getting to the destination that we've put aside the joy in the journey. We've even found sardine cans for our long distance trips. But the future of air transportation is personal. We're really moving in that direction. And before you think that seems like a far off future, this is just one of the prototype designs that's being developed around the world. And there have never been more engineers in this country working on personal air transportation and these flying cars. William Gibson once said, and I'm reminded to say thank you to WGBH for hosting us, he said it first on public broadcasting, the future is already here, it's just not evenly distributed. And any technology like personal air transportation seems like this really rare thing. Think about the airports that you can fly into. You can buy a ticket on the airlines and fly into an airport. There are six of them. They're hard to see on this slide, but there are six of them between Boston and Albany. But let me show you all the airports that you could fly into yourself. There are 200 of them. And this isn't, there is a, a massive magnitude more of heliports. This is only airports with runways. Now, I used to think that pr uh, getting an airplane that you could practically fly from Boston to California in was really the domain of the very rich. And, I mean, literally the jet set, right? until one day I came across this mag magazine article in Wired. 45 miles per gallon at over 200 miles per hour. That's crazy. If you, if you take into consideration that it can fly in a straight line rather than curvy roads, that's actually more fuel efficient than the most fuel efficient car in the world, the Toyota Prius Eco. So I started thinking, wow, maybe it's actually possible to do personal air transportation. Now, if you think that that previous plane looks a little strange, you'd be right. It's not available from a factory. It's only available as an experimental airplane. And this isn't some uh, crazy far off thing. There are people all over America building experimental airplane kits in their garage. And when I say garage, I literally mean this is a kit that you can get shipped to your garage with every single part that you need to build an experimental plane, except for the engine, but including all the nuts and bolts. And you can pick up a used model of the model you saw on the last slide, the Long Easy, for $30,000. But it's not just a few mavericks in a few garages around America. Every year, the Experimental Aircraft Association hosts a fly-in show in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. And 600,000 people, people who really love aviation. What's even more amazing is that 10,000 of them fly in in their own planes. All the planes you see in the bottom right-hand corner and the tiny dots in the top left-hand corner, those are all planes that flew in. And half of them are experimental. So it's really widespread. So there I was a couple of years ago, walking around the showgrounds, looking at different experimental airplanes, trying to figure out which design would get me to California efficiently and 
reasonably quickly. And I realized that fuel efficiency and speed don't really go together unless the plane is really streamlined. So I had to look for the most streamlined. And I found that the most streamlined was the Burkut. It's pretty skinny. It was it's based on a design by Bert Rutan. Bert is this legendary airplane designer come up with these crazy looking new futuristic designs that are radically fuel efficient and fast. In fact, he designed the first plane ever to fly around the world non-stop, non-refueled. Now, the Burkut is a unique combination of not just fuel efficient while fast, 250 miles per hour, and also fun. It's capable of full military aerobatics and can pull more Gs than an F-16 fighter jet. Now, I don't have the skills to build one of these from scratch, so I went out and found an almost built one. And we took this thing and trucked it to my friend's garage in Texas, where he worked on it for two years, ripping out all of the interior systems and replacing them with new ones. And the one thing that I got to design from scratch is the panel. I wanted it to have no old-fashioned gauges, only modern touchscreen glass. And I wanted it to be tactile. The control stick on the right, I had machined from a solid piece of wood. And it's unvarnished, so all I'm feeling in my hand is natural material. And I was able to take my flights into my own hands after going through the test flying process that the FAA makes us do to make sure this isn't going to crash into a random house. But being able to take my flights into my own hands was this incredible eye-opener. These are the flights I was able to take in the Burkut instead of the airlines in just two years. All over the country, including 10 trips to California and back. And it's really more like a flying motorcycle than a flying car. Um, that has some advantages. You can taxi around the airport with the canopies up. It's kind of like driving a convertible. I got to do that at Chicago O'Hare once, and I got a lot of very strange looks from the big airline drivers. And it also has this incredible visibility. You can look all around you, and even down on both sides, and see what the ground right beneath you. But it has drawbacks, too. It's not pressurized. So any long-distance flight, I'm breathing oxygen from a cannula stuffed up my nose. And because the engine's on the back, that makes it more efficient, but it also means there's no cabin heat. And the coldest I've seen the outside air coming in to small leaks is minus 40 degrees. So it's not always the most comfortable, but I wouldn't trade that, I wouldn't trade that for the experience of being a driver and not a passenger in life. It's incredible. When I have a trip from Boston to California coming up, I spend the whole week before looking forward to the flight. And I realize that while aviation and technology attracted me to America, now it's aviation that has allowed me to meet America as I journey across her. It's totally different. You're at half the distance from the Earth that you are in the airlines, and you're able to look all around you, and even down at the ground right underneath you. And I also realized that in addition to the collective freedoms we have, this personal air vehicle has given me personal feeling of freedom. I feel it every time I leave the ground and when I arrive at the opposite coast, here with the San Francisco Bay Bridge right in front of me. But my biggest lesson from this journey is that it's not about me, it's about all of us. Stop and think about the fact that the Wright brothers were amateur experimenters. They received no government funding. No one gave them a grant. 
And think about any advanced technology of the future that you're excited about, whether it's a personal brain-computer interface that we just heard about, or it's a home robot, or personalized medicine, or even a personal flying car. Just look around, because the personal technology of tomorrow is already here if you seek out the amateurs, the experimenters.